So we come to the end of our series this morning, and if you missed the first two, you can go to Open Baptist Church, as I said earlier, on YouTube. Just subscribe or just check it out. There's last two weeks of there, and you can have a listen. Uh, it's been a great time. I really enjoyed this, this series and this opportunity to speak out of a, a portion of Scripture that we know very well, but uh, just to get something new and exciting out of it. And I want to emphasize again this morning as I begin, what we have been looking at as Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light. I just want to emphasize that again. I know it's, it's repetition, but this is very, very significant that he says, you are the salt. You are the light. He doesn't say the person sitting next to you is the salt and the light. He doesn't say, take a, take a chill, you know, come in and, and be blessed and come on a Sunday and come to church and just take a chill. I'm going to do everything for you. Don't worry about it. You can just relax. You don't have to be salt. He doesn't say that. He says, you are the salt. You are the light of the world. So there's no way that we can escape this calling. It's the reason why we are here. It's the reason why we're on earth still and we're not home in heaven. As I said last week, Paul said, you know, it would be better for me by far to be home. That's, I'd, I'd prefer that. But it's, 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 it's actually better, actually, than that, that I stay and continue on in this mission, this calling that we have to make an impact in the world. But we can't make an impact in our own strength. And we can't make an impact by our own authority or through our own effort. We have to remember that we can only make an impact because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. It is His power, it is His strength, it is His work in us that allows us to make an impact. We need to constantly hold on to that and and remember that. And I spent a little bit of time right at the introduction two weeks ago speaking about this. For those of you who are here, you'd remember me speaking about my mom who used to have this huge stamp collection, not posted stamps, these stamps that she would make cards with, you know, like a whole bunch of different types of stamps with animals and all sorts of shapes and hearts and all of these things. And she had these little pads of ink and you'd have to dip the stamp in the ink and then you'd make a mark. You'd, make, you'd, ma- you'd change a blank piece of paper into something beautiful or a card or something into something really beautiful. And that was the end thing back then. And, and so she would make a mark. And I think that's the same for us. It's that we need to be making a mark. We need to be making an impact. And we are like that stamp. We're a tool in the hands of our Creator. But if we are not dipped in the ink, then we can't leave a mark. As I said, if I take a stamp and I try and stamp James Murray's head a few times without any ink, it's going to give him a headache. But it's not going to leave any mark. So we need to be immersed. We need to be dipped, if you like, in the Holy Spirit. We need to be connected to Him if we're going to make any difference. And today, I want to actually focus on this reality that we started off with at the beginning of the series. And I want to focus on this reality in greater depth because it is critical. Everything that we've been speaking about in the first week being salt, in the second week being light, being an impact in different ways in our community, in our world around us, everything we've been speaking about is, is pointless if we don't understand this reality. Because if we try and do all of this in our own strength, it comes to nothing. And so we need to understand that it is critical. All right? A, a salt that is not salty cannot behave like salt at all. A light that is not connected or plugged in, all right, you can, you can take that light and you can switch it on and off as much as you like and you can shake it about and you can do whatever you want with it, but it's not going to work unless it's plugged in. You ever had that problem where you're trying to operate something and you're like, this stupid thing doesn't work, and then you realize you haven't plugged it in at the wall. There's nothing that I can do with this light. I mean, I could probably use it as a paperweight or something, but it's pretty useless unless I plug it in. And so we need to be connected to the Holy Spirit as He does His work in and through us. And so this morning, I want to look at transferred impact. That's what I want to speak about this morning, transferred impact. Because if you think about it, if you go right back to when Christ was here on on earth, He started this whole thing. He started making a real impact in the world. And He changed everything. It was amazing. If you, if you go back to the society at that time, there was inequality in society. There was, there was slavery. Women in that society were oppressed. They were considered as nothing. And he went and, and chilled out and hung out with, with the least of those, with the prostitutes, with the marginalized women of society. And he went and ha- hung out with them. He changed things. In that society, if anyone was weak, 
they were cast away. If a child was born deformed, it was literally chucked out in that society. The world was turned upside down and changed by Christ. And then he ascends up into heaven and he says, right, this mission, this impact, you're going to carry on with it. And so it is transferred to us. That was like 2,000 years ago and still today. It is being transferred to us, this mission to make an impact in the world. I think about the, the parable of the talents. I don't know if you remember that parable where the, the master, the boss, if you like, or the, the, the owner of the estate goes away and he leaves his talents, his, his money, his finance, his wealth to these three servants. He gives five to one and two to another and one to the last servant. And the awesome thing about this parable is that he gives them permission and authority and basically everything that they need to take that, those talents, to take that finance and to do something good with it, to do something significant, to make it even more than what it was before. He gives them that permission. He gives them, he gives them everything they need to make an impact. And for the one servant, he, he goes out and he basically doubles and it becomes five, becomes ten. And the other servant, the same. Two becomes four. And he doubles it and he does something with it. But the sad reality is that there are those who will take that and will bury it in the ground and do nothing with it. But that doesn't change the fact that God has given us everything that we need to make an impact. He's given it to us. And that's an awesome thing. I don't know if, you, if, you, if ever, any of you have ever been in that position, actually, like in the, in the parable, where the boss has gone away, you know, and now suddenly you're left in charge. And so, you know, sometimes it's a good scenario, sometimes it's, it's, it's quite terrifying. That's kind of been my scenario for the last four weeks, all right? Garth has been away. So, and, and before he left, what did he do? He gave me instructions, he gave me responsibilities, and everything that I needed so that I could carry on and do some of the things that I don't normally do and carry on. And the idea being that I do it to the best and maybe even do more than is expected of me. That's the hope. Every time Garth goes away, my hope and my desire is that I won't have to phone him at all, which I haven't had to do, <laughs> you know? And so that's great. I know he's having a good holiday. I've been praying for him and trusting that they'll come back rested. But that's, that, that is essentially kind of what has happened for us as the church. That Jesus made this huge impact, and he says, you know, it doesn't stop here. He transferred it to us. And he said, you are going to go out, and you are going to make an impact in this world. His impacting mission is now ours. The cool thing about it is it didn't just go away and say, all right, I'm going to come back when I return, which we're still waiting for, and, and you're going to carry on in your own strength and your own power, do a good job. No, he said, you know what, I'm going to send a helper. And he did that. And we are so privileged. The veil has been torn in two. We come into the, the very presence of God, something that the, the, the nation of Israel didn't, didn't know or understand, that we are so privileged to, to have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in us so that we actually have everything that we need to make an impact as Christ made an impact when he was on earth. So let's consider our text, the last verse there of Matthew chapter 5. And we've been looking at 13 to 16, and we're going to read just verse 16 now. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, first week we, we focused on the salt, and the second week we focused on the light. This morning I want to spend quite a bit of time focusing on the good works that he speaks about there. There's obviously some kind of significance in them because it makes an impact. He says, when, when people see these good works, when people see the things that you are doing, it makes an impact. And I'm so thankful that we don't have to do something to earn our salvation, that God's grace has been given to us as a gift of His love and His mercy. But if you are committed to Christ, if you are His child, if you've given your life to Him, there's something that comes out of that, the fruit and the work that comes out of that that makes an impact in the world. And that's what he's speaking about here. And, and one can ask, well, what, what are these good works? What is it that we're supposed to be doing? You know, we've looked at the properties of salt, and we've looked at how we need to be shining our light out, not hiding it. So, so what, what are these good things that we're supposed to be doing? Well, maybe the best clue that we can have is just to look at the life of Christ, because he's the one who, who, who set the ball in motion. He's the one who got things going when he was on earth. You see, Christ made an impact in two very primary ways. The one is that he spoke. 
And when he spoke, there was authority, there was power. It's the word of God. Touching lives, changing lives. People would just sit and listen and be in awe as he spoke. And his words impacted people as they listened. But the other thing that he did is he performed, he performed actions or good works or whatever you want to call it. But he did things. He didn't just speak. He lived it out. And he changed people's lives. And it literally turned people, their lives were turned upside down. I mean, you've been blind since birth. And now, suddenly, you can see. I mean, your life is going to change in a profound way. And so, his actions literally turned people's lives upside down. This morning, I I made a list of some of the things that Jesus did. But I thought, let's get our brains going. Can some of you list some of the good works that Jesus did when he was on earth? Let's just throw it out there and see if we can get anything on my list. I've probably not gotten everything. My list is quite small, but let's just see. Any, what, what are some of the things that Jesus did? Heal the sick, all right? What else? Gave sight to the blind. Exercise the demons. Exercise the demons, okay, raise the dead. What else? Okay, preached and preached. So, changed water into wine, cool. Got the party going, yeah? He loved the sinners, right? Mm. Fed 5,000, he fed the hungry, yeah? He washed his disciples' feet, yes. He wept. He wept, yes. Awesome, yeah. He died for us, the most important thing. Yeah, his ultimate act of mercy. Anyone else? He died for us. Then. Yeah, they got this side, but the wall is. <laughs> he also got mad. He also got mad, yeah. All right. I think we've covered everything I got. I said he healed the sick. He cared for people and had compassion. So I actually thought of he wept, yeah. He prayed, yeah. Spent the whole night praying sometimes. Uh, he cast out demons. He stood against injustice in society. I don't think we got that one. Raised the dead, healed people spiritually. He often said, your sins are forgiven. Yeah. All right. He encouraged people. Uh, he disciplined those in error. That, I was also thinking along those lines, the whip and everything else. All right. He befriended the marginalized people in society. He mentored his disciples, uh, washed his disciples' feet. So, and there was extra stuff, as you guys thought of. And we could probably sit here for another half an hour and just, just list the things that he, he did. And, and I, I don't even think... We begin to understand because you see, we live in a society that has been impacted to a degree, and there are still many people who still need to be impacted. But we live in a society that has been impacted in, in ways by Christ that we don't even appreciate. Things like hospitals, things like even universities and, and education and, and privileges that we have today. If you actually go back in history, start it off in the work of Christ, it's an amazing thing. The impact that he has had on the world. But you know the cool thing about it? Is that Jesus promised that we would be able to do these things. And that we would actually be able to do more than this. John 14 verse 12 to 14 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name. And I will do that. It's so encouraging to know that when Jesus says, go and make an impact and go and do these things, he says, you, you're going to do it. When I'm leading you and I'm guiding and you're, and you're living in obedience to me, you're going to do it. We're not, we're, not, we're not being set up to fail. We're being set up to succeed. And we, we're so just fighting in a war that's already been won. But the devil is still out there causing disruption in the world. So we have been given this mission it has been transferred to us. But I want to just spend a little bit of time considering the fact that, that there are certain things that we have also been given that have also been transferred to us to enable us to do the mission. And the first is that He's transferred His power to us. We're called to make an impact in this way by doing these good works in the way that Christ did it. But in order to do this, we're going to need His power. Because right now, this lamp as it is, is just ruining this beautiful flower arrangement over here. It's really just a waste of a lamp. All right, it needs some kind of power. And if you think in particular of some of the some of the works that we have listed, are miraculous things. It's something that a human cannot do, cannot just make happen. 
There are so many miracles that Christ did. He said, you'll be able to do these things. And so, you know, we need His power. It becomes critical and obvious that we cannot do it without it. I don't know if you've ever had a scenario where you've gone to a shop or you've gone to, I don't know, a department or whatever, and you need something to be done, all right? And you're there and you're trying to get something done, and you say to the person, can you do this? And it's maybe a little bit different to what they normally do. And they say, well, I don't have... I don't have the authority. I don't have the permission to do this. So what do you say? You say, well, can I speak to the person who does have the authority? What do they say? Well, they're not here. You know, they left me in charge. But you don't have the... You know, you guys know the scenario. I think Alex had a bit of that at the post office the other week, you know, because she'd been trying to find, locate a parcel we'd sent out, and, they, and we looked on the web, and we phoned the number, and we get there. She gets there. And what do they say? We've got the same number. We've got the same website. You can't blame the person there. They've not been given the authority. They've not been given what they need to do the job. And so you, can't, you, you really can't blame them. I know that for some of us, we get a bit carnal at that point and take all our frustration out on the poor person who's there. But they haven't been given the authority. Here we are, and we have been given the power. Same power that raised Christ from the dead. We've been given that. So we don't need to turn around and say, well, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I, I don't have the authority to do that. You know, why don't you just go to God and you just take your problems to God because I can't really help you. We've been given the authority and the power to continue His work because it's our mission. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. It's our job. It's our task. And I'm so amazed and excited that Christ has given us that authority and that power. And it's not an assumption. It's a fact. Jesus said, as He was ascending to heaven... He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he says, go and make disciples. And making disciples is more than just speaking the words of the gospel. It's living the life of the gospel. It's living it out. It's these good deeds and these actions that we do. That we actually are grace in action to people and not just the words. And he says, you know what? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So go and do this and I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. So I am with you. So all this authority and all this power that has been given to me is with you as the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And that's an awesome reality. So how do we live this out? Well, I thought maybe we can just go back to a similar example that we looked at in the first week when we considered salt. And you remember that one of the properties of salt is healing. So what happens when, when God says to you, I want you to go and I want you to pray for healing for somebody. You know that they're going through a difficult time. You know what they're facing. You know what is wrong with them physically or spiritually or mentally or whatever it might be. And, and, and God lays it on your heart to go and pray for them. Or maybe they come to you and say, look, please, will you just pray with me? I'm going through this right now. And, you know, it's easy to say, just go out there and do it. But sometimes we're like, how, how do we do that? Well, let's take a look at this example. Let's say that this is what God lays on our heart to do. One of the th thoughts that I had on this is that we need to make sure that we don't focus on the power, but the one who gives it. And, and then we can just be certain that he does give us that power. You know, because what a lot of people do is they focus on the power in a negative kind of way. They're like, what happens if they don't get healed? What happens if this doesn't happen? What happens if then they, they, they think I'm a fraud? Or they think I'm not, it's, it's, it's all a fake. What, what, what then? And we get all nervous and we get all scared. Don't focus on the power. Focus on the one who gives it and, and, and be led and guided by him. If he's telling you to do something, if he's instructing you to pray in such a way, if he's instructing you to go and speak to somebody or encourage somebody, or whatever it might be that he's calling you to do, whatever good work it is, whether it's something crazy miraculous that you, you cannot possibly do, or whether it's something that maybe, maybe is, is, is kind of something that you think you can do, but even those things, we're just going to do badly in our own strength anyway. We need the power. But we don't focus on the power, whether it's there or whether it's not there. We focus on the one who gives it. And then we trust that whatever we need as we go and do what he calls us to do is there. It's just there. I don't have to check up. I know that I'm one of these people, obsessive, compulsive. I like to check that everything's in place. This is one of those things where you don't. You just go for it. You just, you just obey. And you trust that it's there. And, 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 and there's the other extreme of focusing on the power. Some people become so obsessed with that power. So obsessed with with this power that they, they, they don't focus on the one who gives it. I think of that story of that character in Acts. The guy who went to the apostles, and I think it was Paul, and wanted to actually buy the power of the Holy Spirit because he was obsessed with it. 
all this wonderful uh, stuff that was going on, all the miracles, and he became obsessed with the power. And that also happens. We focus on the one who gives it. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that we work together. This mission to impact the world is not something that we just do on our own. I think of a lot of the, the events in the book of Acts. They were normally working in, in groups, normally of two. You know, there was Peter and John who went and they healed the, the leper. You remember the song that we all remember from Sunday school? Silver and gold have I none and all of that, right? Two of them. It was Paul and Silas in prison together, singing hymns, and the chains all fell off. They were together. They were working together. Paul and Barnabas. I remember the story of when the whole church was together, and they were praying, and, and amazing things were happening in that service, and the Spirit said to them, right, you need to send out Paul and, and Barnabas. Miraculous kind of thing that was going on there. And they were working together. Paul and Timothy often were working together. Sometimes we feel we've got to do all of these things as Christians on our own. But we don't. And that's such a, a joy and a privilege to know that. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit empowers us is through, through the spiritual gifts. And so that makes it essential for us to work together because no one believer is given every single gift that is there. But we're all given different gifts. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29 to 30, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. You can see it clearly as you read through that particular portion of Scripture. We're not all given everything. It's not like one believer is made into their own church where they've got everything they need to do everything. <laughs> I'm so glad it's that way. Because I know for, for me... I would just get arrogant if, 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 if that happened to me. I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. My pride wouldn't be able to handle it. And so we need to work together. We need to realize that at, at, at times, that we need to call on people who are gifted in certain ways to come alongside us and we work together. It's something powerful and amazing. When we come to a circumstance like this, where we let's just say, go back to our example. We're praying for healing and we pray together. We come together and there's a group of us and that's an awesome thing. It's always exciting to work together as the church. And to see how God transfers His power to us, not just individually, but in different ways to different people. And when it all comes together, it's for the same purpose, building the kingdom. And that's an awesome and a powerful, powerful thing. And so just a couple of thoughts as God transfers His power. We don't need to back away. We don't need to be afraid. Sometimes we're so afraid. But there are ways that we can just have courage. And one of the ways that we do it is that we stand together and we work together in this. The second thing that we need to see that he transfers to us is the love of God. His love is transferred to us to be able to impact the world. This is such a key, important thing. Because God's agape love is so unique and so different to any kind of love that, that comes naturally to us. So different. It is completely unconditional. It doesn't require anything in return. The Bible says that he, he loved us even while we were yet sinners. Even while we were enemies of God, He loved us. That is the kind of love. It doesn't require us to be good. It doesn't require us to, to do certain things. This is the love of God. And if we're going to make an impact in the world, we, don't, we can't just have the power. We need to have the love of God really transferred to us and moving and working in us. It's a critical element in our mission. And I believe that we cannot make an impact without love. I really believe that. Love is the first of the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And fruit of the Spirit is that which grows in us as a result of being connected, as a result of being close to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come naturally to us. That's why Paul says you need to live in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Because what comes naturally to us in the flesh is normally anything but love, Right? And so we need to live according to the Spirit. Often when believers become obsessed with the power that we were talking about earlier, they tend to focus on the gifts of the Spirit and ignore the fruit of the Spirit. But we need both at the same time to make an impact. We need both operating in our lives at the same time. We can't just seek after these gifts because sometimes it can even become a pride thing. I want to be doing all these amazing things for God. Yeah, sure. But we need to be impacted by the fruit of the Spirit at the same time. I don't know how many of you ever watched any of the Mission Impossible movies, but the first one, I like these movies because they're all the gadgets. 
Like James Bond, I like all the gadgets, you know, all these cool technology things. But anyway, first Mission Impossible movie, they had this chewing gum. And the one side was blue and the other side was red. And when you stuck the two pieces together, it, 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 you've got like two seconds and it explodes, right? So you chuck it at something or whatever, it explodes. All right? And so it made this huge explosion when you stuck the two together. And I, I kind of look at the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in the same way. When you stick the two together, bam, there's an impact. Because here, the Holy Spirit is really working through us in every single way that we need Him to, to be able to do this. And we need both to operate at the same time. If we don't, if we say, well, I don't, I don't need love and I don't need that stuff. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. What's the impact? Zero. Nothing. What impact will you make if you're a clanging symbol? It all comes to nothing and nothing is gained. And it's a waste. It's a waste of the gifts that God gives us. It's a waste of the circumstances that God gives us. It's a waste of the talents God gives us. Everything is wasted if we do not have love. So the question is, what if God calls you to something? To go and speak to someone. Let's just say, he says, well, why don't you go and encourage someone who's going through a tough time? Maybe they've lost someone they love. Or, or, or maybe they're going through something that they just can't handle in their own strength. They're really going through a tough time. And the Holy Spirit says, why, this is the good work. This is the good deed that I'm, I'm calling you to do. To go and speak to that person. To go and care for that person. And, and as we think about love and as we think about the compassion that we need, if we're honest with ourselves... We look at it and we say, I, I don't really feel any compassion for that person. Like, if we're really honest. We want to feel compassionate for the person. We do. Like, we want to feel like, oh, shame what they're going through. But normally we hear about it and we think, oh, that's tough. That's, you know, that's really bad. And then we carry on and we do whatever it is that we were doing. So, so what happens when we don't feel that compassion? What happens when, we don't, when that's not coming naturally? One of, the, one of the things that we can do, just quite simply, is to start praying for that person. If God lays it on, our, on your heart to go and encourage someone, go and speak to someone, start praying for them straight away. Pray for their circumstance. Pray for what they're go going through. I've often found that as we do that, God begins to build within us. As we're focusing on that and what He's called us to do, He begins to build within us this compassion. It doesn't come naturally. Another thing we can do is just pray for ourselves. It's great to be honest about this. Rather than going out and saying, uh, and, and pretending to be compassionate, you know? And, and we know all the right words to say, and, oh, you know, this is terrible what you're going through, and, and this is really bad. To actually say, you know what, I actually don't have this. Let me be honest before God, because He can see my heart as dirty and sinful as it is, and as unloving as it is. And let me just say, God, I need this. This is... I need you to change this in me. Let me just surrender. Let me be honest. Let me surrender to you so that when I go out and when I speak to this person, this is something that's real. This is heartfelt, genuine compassion. Take a bit of time to consider their circumstance. Sometimes all we need as well is just to get out of our own little world and just have a look at what they're going through. And just a little note on the side, one of the things we need to be careful of is that while, as we soak ourselves in compassion, sometimes we also need to just be removed in some sense from the circumstance. You know, if someone's going through pain because someone else has caused them pain, and then you also get angry with that someone else to the point that you're bitter and you're angry, how are you going to help them forgive? You know what I'm saying? Just a little thought on the side there, that while we need to immerse ourselves in compassion, we also need to realize that in order to help them, we've got to be somewhat removed and to look at it from a different perspective and to be able to say, you know, it's encourage you. It's help you. Let's, let's help you work through this. Sometimes a doctor has to do that. You know, we want a doctor that's compassionate. We all want that. We don't want some clinical person who's just going to, you know, be kind of harsh with us. But at the same time, sometimes a doctor needs to inflict a little bit of pain in order to make things better. So sometimes we have to also be just a little bit removed from it. And, and, and these are things that we just need God's guidance and help. And I believe that instead of just going out and just hitting, hit strong into the situation, 
to take a bit of time to reflect, to pray, to just stand before God and say, you know what, I need you to change me, I need you to help me, because in my own strength, I'm just a useless light that isn't plugged in. I can't do this in my own strength. So we go out into the world and we strive in the strength of God to make an impact. And you know what? We will. We will. Because Jesus has promised us. He's encouraged us. He said, you will do these things. You will do greater things than this. And we go out into the world and we will make an impact. But then comes something else that we need to be wary of. Because then comes the glory. People see these things and they're impressed. Because nobody has ever cared for them like that before. Nobody has ever taken notice in that kind of way. Nobody has ever prayed for them and they've been healed. And, and they're impressed and they're amazed and they're like, wow, this is incredible. The last thing I want to speak about this morning that needs to be transferred is not something that God transfers to us. This is something now that we transfer to God. And that is the glory. And sometimes it's kind of like, you know, we need to be like, the traffic cop in the picture, where we, we kind of, you know, it comes at us, and it's like redirecting traffic, where we've got to say, you know what, it's that way. Actually, that way. The glory is, belongs to God. Because when we are able to do these amazing things, we don't take the glory. Jesus said in this verse that they would see your good works. There's something impacting about these good works. There's something amazing about these good works. And he says that they will see these things. They will, they will experience your life. They will experience your saltiness. They will see your good works. And what? They will glorify God in heaven. That is what we want to see. That is the impact, ultimately, that we want to see in people's lives. Now, this might seem like an obvious thing. But I think many, many Christians fail at this point. And we, we're nervous as we get into this thing and God calls us to something different and we, and we take a step and suddenly we're doing it and it's exciting. And, and it's, it's like, almost like the, 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 the lepers that for, forgot to say thank you. And sometimes we're like that. We're so excited and so caught up in it that we forget to give the glory to God at the end of the day. Many Christian leaders have fallen prey to this as their ministry has grown and they've lost respect over time, and they've lost impact over time as pride began to pollute their ministry. Some people try the false humility thing, you know, because we know we're supposed to be humble, and we know we're supposed to give the glory to God, so we say all the right things, you know. Oh, no, it's not me, it's all God, you know, and we say all the right things, but if we, in our hearts, it's not that way, and we have to search our hearts, because deep down inside, we're just hoping that someone else will also notice and yeah, we'll say the right things and we'll give the glory to God, but man, we just hope someone else will also notice because it's really cool to be noticed and to be appreciated in that way. But humility has to come from the heart. You know, if you try and hold on to the glory, your impact will fade. What is more, you'll find stress. Now, we have enough stress as it is, but stress will overwhelm you because suddenly you have to try and keep people impressed because that has become your focus. Very subtly and very slowly, it has become your focus to impress other people and to do whatever it is you do to, to, to look good. And, and, and you, you are now under such pressure to keep that up that you become stressed out. You know what? All we've got to do is live in obedience to God. It simplifies everything. Because instead of going into the situation saying, oh, what will this person think and what will that person do? And man, I just need to keep this thing going and everything needs to be looking good over here. We just say, well, what, God, what do you want me to do in the story? I'm going to do it. And whatever glory comes, it's going to go to you. Simple as that. Think about it like this. All the power, all the love, all the gifts, all the fruit, everything that you have to make an impact is transferred to you. The saltiness is transferred to you. The light is transferred to you. The abilities that you have, the gifts that you have, everything that you're able to, to do these amazing things is transferred to you. It's logical then that we don't get the glory. Because it's all God. Like the story of Gideon. May He put us in circumstances that are so impossible in fact that we cannot take the glory. It's all Him. I want to say if you battle with this in your heart, then give it to God. Again, Let's be real about it. 
Let's be honest. Let's say, you know what? I want people to notice when I do something, when I do a ministry in the church, when I do something in the community. And, and, and hand it over to God and repent about it. If necessary, sometimes we even need to say, you know what? I'm going to intentionally take on a ministry that's going to humble me. Sometimes people, they strive after the ministries that all like, really look impressive and really look good. You know what? I'm going to do whatever it is in the church that will humble me the most until I can learn to give the glory to God. Sometimes we need to do that. We need to take the necessary steps in our life to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Transfer the glory. As I draw all of this to a close, it's a beautiful passage of Scripture. The thought that came to my mind is that Psalm, Psalm 8, and David says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You know, God, as I look at your creation, as I look at all of your creation that declares your glory, that in itself makes an impact, because people look out and they see these amazing things that God has created. Why use me? You know? Why use us? It's, it's, it's this question that boggles our minds sometimes and, and brings us to a place of humility again. And as I considered that, I thought, you know, but his plan is perfect. He wants to use us and his plan is perfect. That's what he desires and has chosen to do. So I want to ask you this morning, will you shine your light? Challenge from last week. To take it out from that bowl that it's hidden in. And not just that, to, to place it on the highest stand. And as you do that, to be aware that we cannot do it in our own strength. That we actually need to plug in to the power of God if we're going to make an impact. To plug into His strength. To be part of something that is bigger and more exciting than anything else we could ever know. To make an impact in this world for the glory of God. That the mark of God will be placed on the lives of countless people around you. And that as you look around at the people that are all around you, even now, that there would be an excitement in your hearts to know that they will be changed. The people around you sitting here in this church will be changed because of, of the light that you shine. The people around you at your workplace, where you study, where you socialize, wherever you go, will be changed, will be impacted. And that at the end of the day, ultimately, because everything comes from God, every, everything that we have comes from God, that they would say, wow, this cannot be a human thing. There is something more going on because I can't understand how a person can love like that. And I can't understand how a person can care like that. And I can't understand how it is that you do the things that you do. This has to be God. Like that centurion as he looked up, this must be the Son of God. It has to be the work of God. It has to be the light of God. And that people who have never worshipped God, people who have, who have fought against God, who have never believed in God, would suddenly be lifting their hands up in worship all around us and praising God because of the impact that you have made. That's an exciting thing. We get to be a part of it. 